election. Uh, <clears throat> Why is, the, uh, why is mass media supposed to be a sort of lifeblood of democracy? McChesney talked about that in the interview, too. In what sense is, is a vibrant media supposed to be the lifeblood of a democracy? Um, it was supposed to present people with adequate information so people can have a sense of their own democracy and self-government in a social term. That sounds good. Yeah, democracy. And this is the reason why McChesney had said, he says, I've been studying this and doing research on this for years. He'd been writing about issues like this uh, all the way back since the early 1980s. Now, <clears throat> the idea of democracy is predicated on the idea of one person, one what? One person, one vote. And for your vote to be a meaningful vote, you have to have what? You have to have the information to make self-government meaningful. So the idea is, and this, this is part of why McChesney didn't talk about that in this interview, this is why at the very beginnings of this country, Thomas Jefferson put forth postal subsidies. Post office subsidies, in other words, the government subsidized the post office so information could be spread. There's also an apocryphal story about Thomas Jefferson, not that he's a hero or anything like this. But uh, keep in mind, uh, we, we get this false impression that it's only today that politics have been so virulent, you know, people mudslinging at one another, insults and so forth. Well, guess what? It has technically always been that way in this country. And foreign diplomats saw all the scathing things written in the press about Thomas Jefferson. And their question was, well, why do you allow this to take place? Well, he says, well, in order for democracy to work, you have to have what? A variety of positions. In other words, the media should be something like a cacophony of different points of view with a whole lot of information so that people can theoretically do what? Now, of course, this is why education matters. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, they can think meaningfully about the information and they can draw their own conclusions, make their own decisions. Of course, if you don't have the information and if you also don't have an educated populace, or I should say a fairly educated populace, Good luck with making this ideal of democracy work. Good luck with it. But anywho, this is part of why he, he argues that the media is so darn important. It's because it is most people's source of information. The problem is, we never get the news unfiltered, as if we, there could be a such thing as the news unfiltered. Anyone know why, as if there could be a such thing as the news unfiltered? Any takers? Or is it too early? Well, keep in mind, as long as you have a network of some sort, there are going to be individuals who are going to be doing what? This, pretend this whole board right here is all the information in the world. Now, of course, that's a silly idea, because all the information in the world could be potentially what? Potentially infinite, all of the information that's in the world. Well, guess what? You could only fit so much information into the... You've probably heard this expression. You could only fit so much information into the news hall. So what happens? Decisions will be made as to what is going to be to make it through, and I'm going to use a phrase that's not in the book, what is going to make it through various filtering processes to make what is going to be the news. And I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. McChesney did say that things have changed dramatically over the last 20 years. And this is mentioned in chapter 12 of your book. And I want you to know this because it will, what matters, number one. Number two, it will also be on the final.
When McChesney and others speak about traditional gatekeepers, and when I say gatekeepers, I mean <clears throat> basically the decision mechanisms that lead to determining what makes it into the news and what doesn't make it. When we talk about traditional gatekeepers, who are we talking about? What kind of institutions? The major news networks, the traditional major news networks, and also the wire services, so on and so forth, that would gather information, and they would be the ones who end up determining what is the news that's fit to print. Now it turns out, folks, and by the way, all the news that's fit to print, this won't be on the test, but uh, whose slogan was that? All the news that's fit to print. Oh, that was the New York Times. It is the New York Times, excuse me. All the news that's fit to print. The problem is, all of the information out there is not necessarily fit to print for various reasons. And now I'm going to get into chapter 11 here. There are various interest groups that, in a sense, determine what is likely to make it into a news broadcast or newspaper and what is likely to get filtered out. Now, what are the four interest groups that have an effect upon what the final product is going to look like? And before you answer that, I'll make one little caveat. Many people are under the false impression that who is in control of what ends up becoming the, making the final product? Many Americans are under what false impression about who the deciders are? What's that? Well, that too. In other words, that, that they cater to demand. That is somewhat correct, but somewhat false, and I'll talk about why. Now, the answer I want to give there is the journalists. Many people think that there are far left journalists in control over the media. Well, that first presupposes a couple things. That journalists are allowed to investigate and print whatever they want. Whatever they want to investigate and print. It forgets that journalists actually have superiors that make those decisions for them. In other words, there's the editorial board of the newspaper. You know, things have to get past the administrative editing process in order for it to make it into the final product anyway. It also presupposes what about journalists, political views? That they are left of center. It turns out that most mainstream people are what? Oh, the answer is centrists. So guess what you would find? that most people who work for newspapers and so forth are fairly mainstream people. So if anything, even if the journalists were in control of the information, you would expect not a left-wing or a right-wing bias, you'd actually expect what I would call, I, not what I, what anarchist social critic Noam Chomsky calls a mainstream bias. In other words, radical point of views, if they are conveyed at all, will likely be conveyed how? Dismissively. That is, if they are likely to be presented at all. And this is because if the, the journalists were in control of things, which they're not, they would actually investigate their opinions on things. And their opinions would typically be what? I'll give you the answer. Corporate. You would expect their opinions to be corporatized opinions, because why? Most of us are taught to think about things in those kind of terms. Most of us are institutionalized to think in terms of things in normal institutional ways. This is why you wouldn't expect most people who have made it to be what? And when I say made it, I mean made it economically, gotten nice jobs and things of that nature. You wouldn't expect them to be too much out of the mainstream. Because people outside of the mainstream aren't likely to be able to climb the ladder to get there. Because why? Typically people who climb the ladder are normal. 
In other words, institutionalize people. Does that make good sense? This is why you would expect a pro-institutional bias in your mainstream outlets. And by the way, mainstream, what we call left of center and mainstream right of center is still what, folks? It's still mainstream. In other words, it is normal American politics and you would expect those normalized points of views to be replicated. And guess what you get? That is what you get. There are viewpoints outside of the mainstream that you are not likely to hear. Now before I talk about the mechanics of why, the text talks about this. There are four main power factions that kind of have a role in determining what the final product of the media looks like. Now, Mr. Hunter actually mentioned one of them. The people is the way our text puts it. Consumers is another way of putting it. Let me give you one other way of putting it, although it won't be on the test. You might call these consumers These are the end users of the media. Now keep in mind, the reason I'm calling them end users is because there are other factions that have a role in making the final product look the way it does. Now what are the other three groups that the, that the chapter talks about? And these will be on the test. What are the other three groups? Is it really that early? Yeah, Mr. Smith, thank you. Yeah, thank you. We're doing these in no particular order. Yeah, it's what the author of our text simply refers to as big business. Now, what are the other two? I'll give you one of them. The media institutions themselves. And then finally, and finally, government, AKA government. These are the four sort of power factions that have an influence upon what the final product is going to look like. Now, Many people, and this is what Mr. Hunter was talking about, many people are under the false impression, and this is one of McChesney's arguments from one of his other books. Many people get the, get the false impression that what drives supply, or what, what shall I say, what drives supply? Yeah. Yeah. That's that phrase that demand supposedly drives supply. In other words, if the consumers didn't want it, they would do it very differently. Now, McChesney has argued that if this is really the media's model, then it is antithetical to our ideal of, of the media. What do I mean when I talk about our ideal of the media? What is the ideal job of the media? <clears throat> to inform the public. Yeah, to inform the public. If, what you're, if, merely, if all you're doing is merely saying, now what do the consumers want to hear? And then you're catering to that. That would actually be a pathway towards not information, but misinformation. So McChesney would say, if that's what they're trying to do anyway, that would be antithetical to democracy. But what he actually will argue is that more often than not, that the media institutions will use supply to drive demand. Does anyone know how this works? 
You produce the product that is cheapest and easiest to produce, in other words, that's cost effective, and then you drive home the message to the people that this is what they ought to want. Now this has, this has nothing to do with the news, but this does have to do with media entertainment. McChesney pointed out that there was no time in the 1990s that the people stamped down their feet and said, we want reality TV. What, ha what is what actually happened? Slowly yeah, the media outlets found out that this was a cheap and easy way to fill the entertainment hall. They found out that it was a perfect vehicle for product placement, thus another source of revenue streams. And they also found out that if you did it the right way and made it a big enough train wreck, that the people would actually want to see it. And of course, you know how they drive demand for most TV shows anyway. These days, they will just hyper-commercialize the next best thing that they're going to be showing. So they will tell you, hey, this is going to be airing Thursday nights. And they'll have it on in the middle of one of their TV series that you've already been coerced into watching. So they create the supply and then they find vehicles for driving demand. And they will want to do so at the lowest possible cost. Now it turns out that this model will also be the way, will also be effective for what? Not just their entertainment model, but also for the news model. You will want to have a news model that is also cheap and easy to produce. That, and that also doesn't do what? That also doesn't step on the toes of these two. Uh, and admittedly, these are not monolithic factions. What do I mean by they are not monolithic? It's difficult just to dump big business into one big pot because sometimes what? Some company interests are different from other companies' interests. Their interests in, uh, in getting market share might be at odds with one another. But in general, the goal of business is to do what? The goal is to make money you didn't need me to tell you that. And granted, they want a media system that does what? And this is why McChesney, this is why Chomsky and Herman's propaganda model of the news, this is also why our textbooks discussion suggests that even though to some extent the media does have to uh, appeal to end users, take a guess who else? they are actually selling to. And by the way, McChesney had a line, let me give this to you if you didn't notice it. And I wrote it so small I can barely even see it. Oh, uh, the line was, oh, it was something like this, I can't see it. If they're giving you something for free, yeah. you are the product. How many of you remember hearing that? If they're giving you something for free, you are the product. In other words, the whole goal of the whole apparatus is basically to cater to big business interests. Now, why do they have to cater to big business interests? Not that there's not other interests they have to cater to. Because these people are the ones who do what? they buy advertisements. Now granted, new media has changed things a little bit. But keep in mind, the more things change, you know the cliche? In many ways, things in state remain the same. And McChesney would argue even gotten worse. Because back in the day before new media, the major uh, information source was what? This is, this is like before the, the last 15, 20 years. The main source of information was TV. 
YTB? The answer is obvious. Yeah. A little more specific. It's easy. All you got to do is click the, do click the remote on, or I guess back in my day, you didn't have remotes and you, you turned on. All you had to do was turn on the TV. In other words, you don't have to get your eyeglasses out. You don't have to read, etc., etc. It is unmediated. They, you, know, you can simply turn on the news or whatever, and you can get your information. Now keep in mind, there's another reason why TV rather than newspaper or political magazines. A lot of people, A, don't like to read, and a lot of people what? Cliche alert, don't read so good. Yeah, I mean, that's a sad reality. A lot of people just don't read so good. So it's understandable why television of course, which comes along after what other media? And by the way, did I go off on this rant before? I hate it when people talk about illiteracy, as if anybody who couldn't read counted as illiterate. Because, and then you get the assumption, well, therefore they're stupid. Well, that's not true at all. Simply because people can't read doesn't mean they can't communicate, think, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just a lot of people didn't have access to it. The precursor to TV was, of course, what? Yeah, it was, of course, radio. TV is, of course, way more effective. Because of what? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, you just turn on and images. Images are more effective to convey things than words. They're far more memorable, far more emotional, etc., etc. But yeah, during the age of television, what you had was your... Your businesses would buy advertisements. Of course, we have ads in the internet age, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But they would buy ads. And this is what Chomsky and Herman call the advertising filter. It's also discussed in your textbook. It was sort of understood by the business office of the media outlet that they would have to tread softly when it came to their what? When it came to news stories that, that have anything to do with their advertisers, they would have to tread softly. And by the way, there were plenty of documented cases of this. What's it mean to tread softly? If a story might negatively affect one of your advertisers, it might not make them very happy if you broadcast it or print it. And there was a time when the business actually had to speak up and say, look, if you keep printing stories like the one that you just did about us, we will take our business elsewhere. Now, when it comes to TV, they were getting 100% of their revenues from where? 100% of their revenues were from advertising. So if you lose one of your biggest clients, that could actually adversely affect the network. This is why before they decide what stories are going to end up making it into the news hall, they might want to question how it will, how it will affect their major advertisers. These days, and McChesney talks, talked about this in one of his other interviews, these days, big business doesn't have to apply any direct pressure anymore. Does anyone know why? Because the media institutions know what? Cliché. They know the score already. In other words, the institutional model has been in place long enough that they know that there are certain kinds of stories they cannot investigate. There are certain kinds of stories they will not be able to print, and so forth. 
because if they did, it would jeopardize their ad, their ad revenue. Now, how about government? For what reasons might a media, a tradition, a tradie media outlet have wanted to placate government? And keep in mind, this is, this is not necessarily an easy question because government also isn't a monolith. What am I talking about? Criticizing government might mean criticizing Senator X's vote on something. Criticizing government could be a whole wide range of different kinds of criticisms. Now, many of you would say, but I, I watch the media and they seem to be really critical of the media, or rather very critical of government. Well, A, I would say it's not that substantially critical of government. What are the kinds of things critical of government that tend to get a lot of uh, rotation? Oh, speaking from the days of record, sorry. Yeah, what kind of critical stories of government tend to get lots of heavy rotation? Meanwhile, more important stories that would be critical of government don't even get mentioned. Yeah, he nailed it. 